Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Neil Shah, and this is Expecting More Dialogues, which is a new web series we're kicking off um, that is exploring the opportunities, the challenges, the hopes, and uh, the lived experiences of people who are giving birth in America right now. It turns out that an American today is 50% more likely to die in childbirth than her own mother was. And if you're a Black person in America, you're three to four times more likely to die than if you're a white person, and that's irrespective of education or income. Um, we've invited three incredible human beings to be part of this dialogue that we're gonna have today and to teach me uh, and to teach all of us about what it is that we can be doing about this problem. Um, the first of those really incredible human beings is Bruce McIntyre. Uh, Bruce uh, is the father of a beautiful baby boy um, he is the founder of the Save a Rose Foundation. He's a birth activist um, and uh, I believe is one of the most important emerging voices for racial justice in our country right now. Um, so thank you, Bruce, for being here. Thank you for having me, Neil. Thank you. Um, and I've also invited two of my teachers uh, to be here. Um, the first, uh, is Lash Nolan. She's a student at Harvard Medical School and I'm on the faculty of Harvard Medical School, but she's one of my teachers uh, because um, for the last year, she's been putting all of her faculty on notice about how medical education needs to change. Um, and so thank you, Lash, for all that you're doing and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Neil. Thank you for being one of my teachers too. <laughs> uh, and last but certainly not least is Chanel Portia Albert, who is a birth worker herself, a social justice warrior, the founder of Ancient Song Dula Services, um, a fellow board member at the March for Moms with me, and a longtime teacher of mine. In fact, uh, in my brain, we're roughly the same chronological age, but she's a very old soul um, and uh, has been thinking about these issues uh, far longer than I. So thank you so much, Chanel, for being here, too. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's start here maybe, Bruce. Um, one of the things that you and I talked about recently is how one of the greatest joys in fatherhood is, um, you know, seeing your partner through your child. And, um, you know, you, you talked recently around Father's Day about what it was like for you when you first learned that you were gonna be a father. And maybe let's just start there. Can you tell that story? We were excited very excited um like like i've mentioned before this isn't anything that was unexpected this is something that we had planned in advance um got prepared for you know um we had milestones and goals that we were always setting and that we reached and um finding out when she, that she was pregnant was just oh she would the, the excitement in her face and her smile like she had this very warm smile um she came into the room she, after taking her pregnancy test and jumped on me while i was half asleep you know we're pregnant um you know took a took another one to double check um she's very excited and you know we were just looking forward to our lives together. We were looking forward to raising um, our child together. You know, this is the start of our family. This is the start of, um, of us creating an empire together. This is the start of our lives. Um, it's supposed to be the happiest, most joyous moments. And, you know, that was ripped from us. So it's, it's tough. Um, Tell us know. about that, Bruce. Tell us what happened. I'm not sure everybody out there knows the story. So and before COVID, actually, Amber was facing negligence and incompetence within the medical system. Um, you know, she wasn't being heard. She was voicing her concerns and she was just being brushed off. Um, oh, take this. Um, let's see how you feel. Um, stuff like that. Oh, take these iron pills. You'll be all right. Like, they they weren't listening to her, and then whenever COVID approached, it seemed like they used that more as an excuse um, to to dismiss her and her and what she was feeling. So, you know, during the COVID times, 
Um, in was it March? I believe it was March, especially March. So March, she had to get all of her appointments canceled. Everything was telephonic, um, Zoom conference calls, um, and she's you know coming into from her second trimester into her third. She's supposed to be seen every two weeks coming into every week she's supposed to be seen. So they're canceling all of her appointments. They canceled her high risk appointment at the end of the month. Um, gave, they, they made us go buy our own blood pressure monitor to keep up with her blood pressure. Um, take iron pills, you know, and she's telling them, hey, I need to be seen. Like my body doesn't feel right. She's having complications breathing. She's feeling weak. Um, you know, and, and women know their bodies, you know, and I feel like this happens way too often to where they're voicing their concerns and not being heard. They're just being, you know, brushed to the side. They'll recommend them to do something without even trying to take a look at them and figuring out what's going on. Um, we were getting, um, we, we weren't seeing, we weren't being seen at all in March. Um, everything was just going so far left in March. So, you know, the, the time is getting closer. Our son is due May 30th. Um, so now we're, we're coming into April and we're, we're being neglected so much that we, we just decided, hey, we're gonna try to find midwives and doulas. Um, so we were we were interviewing interviewing midwives and doulas found a lovely group called birth from the earth they helped us out um they're actually the people that i'm in partnership now with. so they were actually the ones to make us aware that amber's platelet levels were drop were dropping significantly um not the doctors they had four or five different doctors write off on her paperwork as her platelet levels are dropping and nobody is making us aware of this. Nobody. Um, because we could have caught this early on. This is not something that's, that's, that's intreatable. This is something that, it, that you know, you're supposed to be monitoring and taking care of. Um, her platelet levels, once, once your platelet levels are at a 125, you need to be heavily mon monitored at this point. Whenever we found out her play levels were well under 125, well under 125. Um, and that was still not alarming to them. Um, there was no, no urgency. Um, so we ended up going to get some updated blood work cause, because we figured, okay, well, she's high risk. Well, maybe we can still get her into a birthing center. Um, there's a, a birthing center out here in Brooklyn that we were gonna go to. So we figured, okay, let's get this updated blood work um, because we have to get it for the doctors anyways, because we ended up switching from one Montsefiore facility to another facility um, just in case. Um, and this happens to be the same facility that her mother worked at and her mother's been in the Montsefiore facility for 25 years. So they knew Amber, the doctors knew Amber growing up. Um, we ended up getting some blood work done on the 11th of April. That whole week she's calling like, hey, can I get this information back? We need, we need the information, the due date's getting closer. Um, nothing, we're not hearing anything. She's leaving voicemails, calls, everything. So she reached out to her mother to reach out to somebody in a higher tier that can speed up the process, um, which is something we shouldn't have to be doing. It was, it was very unsettling to us because Amber already felt like we were g giving birth during the apocalypse. You know, it, it was already an unsettling feeling for us. And then for all of these other things to just occur while we're trying to receive proper care um, really stressed her out and it, and it put a lot on us. Um, so that's when she made that post on the, the 17th um, that she was wanting to do a tell all and um, speak on the incompetence that she was dealing with because I was there for the whole process. Um, we, we seen everything that they were doing. Amber had a bad feeling that 
she wasn't going to make it, especially coming into her third trimester. She was already, she was scared in her second trimester, you know, and then she was frightened by her third trimester, by, by the way, everything was just going. Um, so we ended up going to, because she, she was still high risk. Um, the doctors ended up calling us the very next day on the 18th um, to come in for a treatment that they needed her to come in for treatment that her platelet levels had pretty much dropped in half from the last time we were updated. Um, and yeah, that was very, very low. Um, so we ended up, we ended up taking her. They wouldn't allow me to come up with her. She did not want to go up by herself. She didn't want to be in a room by herself with them. She did not trust them. Um, And due to COVID, they weren't allowing me to come up. They weren't allowing her mother to come up, even though she worked in the hospital and she had a badge and she had the proper PPE. They still weren't allowing her to come up. Um, they assured her mother, we have somebody specifically assigned to her. Um, you know, that's your daughter. We, we're going to take really good care of her. Um, she never got to meet that high risk doctor at all. It's kind of like he, that, that doctor passed it off to a younger doctor who it kind of seemed like she didn't really know what she was doing. Um, it was a lot of, a lot of back and forth, which was very as well unsettling with Amber and I. Um, so it went from, she's in there for treatment for a couple of hours to she needs to be there for a day. Um, they're taking forever to run tests on her. Um, they keep thinking, oh, maybe your platelet levels are dropping like this due to COVID. Maybe you have COVID. Let's just keep trying COVID. Um, tested her for COVID twice, came back negative. Amber and I are very healthy people. We followed the rules. We stayed inside. We protected our baby. We, you know, it's a newborn. We're not going to jeopardize our child um, just from social distancing, you know? So they kept testing her for COVID, came back negative. Um, then they, they, find, they came to the finalization that, oh, it's either going to be COVID or it's going to be um, preeclampsia. And also as, as, she's, um, as her platelet levels are dropping, she also developed um, anemia. She became anemic as well. Um, so being, being that said, what they were also telling her was, oh, well, we don't know what you have right now. You don't have COVID, but we're going to treat you as if you were a COVID patient. So when you hear that, you think, okay, maybe they're just going to wear extra PPE to be safe. They're going to take extra precautions. Um, that's, that's really not what it seemed like. And, and Amber left notations. Amber was always the one to leave notations. She always had a question for something, always wrote it down no matter where she was at. Um, so she was asking these questions. Hey, does, does the head surgeon know you're doing this? Do they know that you're doing this? Do they know that you're giving me this? Um, and yet again, they're just assuring us with everything. So they, Amber actually ended up calling me on the 20th, um, telling me to, that they were going to induce her labor um, and that they, they also had just found out that same day that she had developed help syndrome. People do not typically die from this. Um, and that's the same day that they decided they wanted to operate on her. They didn't give her no types of time um, or figure out extra you know, precautions that they need to take um, that could save her. So... I ended up going to the hospital. They induced her labor. Um, Amber was telling me to pack a bag as if I was going to be there for a day or two. I'm in that room with her for maybe a couple of hours um, before they take her away from me. They were telling me that the baby was um, not handling the contractions well, um, but he was not in any distress. The baby was not in distress. He was just still growing. He was still attached to the placenta. He was still wanting to, it wasn't time for him. Um, and it just seemed like they wanted him out so bad. 
you know, not not Amber, the doctors. Um, they came back to us like, hey, these are the procedures that we may need to take. Cesarean being the very last, the very last. Um, they're telling us, you know, the chances of her passing away are very, very, the woman told me very low, like six times. Um, you know, that everybody's going to be working with her. Everybody that were, you know, I would expect to be in that room with her is going to be in that room with her. Um, they have everything in the back ready. Mind you, they have everything in the back ready for her. So they came back, you know, maybe 40 minutes after seeing us. We need to take you into C-section now. You need to get out of the room. Um, we're going to relocate you to a different room. Um, they weren't allowing me to give her a hug, give her a kiss. I had to wear PPE. Um, and then yet again, we're already, we already have this unsettling feeling. One of the nurses was telling, you know, telling me about the importance of me wearing my PPE around her. Um, mind you, <laughs> she just had taken off her gloves and she's like, oh yeah, COVID is everywhere. We don't know who has COVID. We could have COVID. We've never been tested. That is such an unsettling feeling. Like you, it's like something just shot up my spine and like my hair was just standing straight off of my skin. Um, like, why would you say that to someone when they're about to go into delivery? You know? Um, so we're, we're already scared and they're, they're rushing me out the room. I can't say my proper goodbyes. The last thing I was talking to Amber about, she had me singing to Elias in her stomach and talking to him. So he's active and aware that he's, he's coming. Um, and then she looks at me and she says, I'm scared. I tell her we're going to be fine. These are medical professionals, you know, they're going to take care of you. Your mom's been working here. They're going to look out for you. Um, you know, we're going home. This is, this is what we've been preparing for. And she looks at me and she says, yes, all three of us are going home. And that was the last time I seen you, Amber. They told me to wait in a room for her. She'll be back in 20 minutes. I was um, standing outside of the room that they had designated me to. Um, and in front, of, in, in front of that room, you can look through these double doors and you can see the room to the OR. And I just see a whole bunch of doctors rushing in there. Um, I had no clue that that was Amber's room. I seen them rushing my baby out covered in blood um, in a bucket <laughs> running. Um, and then as soon as, you know, as soon as I see that, I'm like, oh, that's my, that's my son. Um, ex I'm excited. Like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to meet him. I'm ready to hold him. And then I hear on the intercom that they're calling for all medical emergency, emergency staff to the back um, stat that they needed everyone. Um, they had to say that Amber was a non COVID patient three times over the intercom before people really started rushing to her aid. And, you know, I, I just had this, like my excitement for everything just flew out the window. My heart sunk to my stomach because I, I now I know something is going far left. Um, we're asking head nurses for information. Nobody's trying to tell us anything. Nobody is telling us anything. Um, and then the head nurse asks, hey, is there anyone that can, you know, be here for you right now? I've had enough death in my family to, to, to understand those signs that, you know, this is, this is not good. Um, her mother actually ended up working a late shift that night so she could be close to Amber. Um, so she was already in the hospital. So they allowed me to call her up, you know, and I, I fill her in on everything. Um, you know, she's trying to figure out what's going on. You know, nobody's telling us anything. 
um, was just praying at this point. And then the head nurse comes back again because she sees like, I'm, I'm not handling it well. Oh, do you have anybody else that could be here for you? Where's your mother? Where's your father? That's already not a good sign, you know? Um, they're setting up a family room for, for our families to come. During the times of COVID, when they, were, they weren't allowing people to come up. So that's already, that's another bad sign. So you guys are, um, you guys are just dropping your COVID rule, you know, for us, because everything is okay, you know? Um, and I just took that as a bad sign because I, I had the feeling that they knew she wasn't going to make it. Um, but they just didn't want to tell us. So, you know, the family shows up, they're in the family room. Um, Amber's mother, Renita is, is trying to get me away from that window. Cause I'm just glued to that window. Like I did not want to leave. And they're, you know, she's trying to get me away. The nurses are trying to get me away. Oh, do you want to go see your son? Oh, come see the family. Um, so, you know, I took, I took a little break to go see the family, go check on my son. Um, and as I'm walking by, um, towards, you know, heading towards the elevator and I'm, he and I'm walking by the front desk, I'm hearing nurses screaming, oh, why hasn't this showed up? Where is this? This hasn't arrived from the blood bank yet. Where is this? But they had just assured me that they had everything prepared for Amber in that room. So, you know, I, I go see the family. I go check on Elias. And I just remember that whole time, like, I didn't want to see anybody. Like, I just wanted to see Amber. I just wanted to be with Amber. So, you know, I see the family, give them hugs. I'm, I'm, I'm with them for maybe two minutes. Um, I go check on my son. And I feel like at this point, I'm supposed to be very excited. You know, I'm, I'm seeing my son for the first time. And it was just so hard to go see him because I was just so worried about Amber. Like I was, like I really wanted to check on his mother. Like I'm glad my son is fine. I'm glad he's healthy. Like, I'm glad he is okay, but I need to be there for his mother. And that's all I kept thinking about that whole time. So I'm with him for maybe like five minutes and I'm rushing back upstairs, back on the window. Um, they were operating, operating on her for two hours. Um, I'm, I'm back at the window and I'm seeing doctors leaving. Um, you know, I, I see black doctors staring at me as if they had something to tell me. I have black nurses staring at me as if they have to tell me something like they want to so bad, but they just can't. Um, and then I have, you know, white, white doctors leaving the room, you know, tapping me on, tapping me on my shoulder. Oh, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Like three, four different doctors. Oh, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. They, you know, I don't see Amber. So the nurse and everybody's just calling us to back to the family room. Um, And we're, we're sitting in there for a while and I just had this really bad feeling like she's not here anymore. Like Amber is not with us anymore. And like, I couldn't shake that feeling. The doctor came into the room. Um, oh yeah, the baby's fine. The baby's healthy, uh, but we're sorry for your loss. I completely lost it after that. Um, because when he said that, I'm just thinking back to 
how everything unfolded and everything started with her OBGYN. Um, and the, the, I felt like the surgeon, the head surgeon wasn't really paying attention to, to the things that Amber and I were talking about because we're not organ donors. Um, I, I, you know, we told them in the room, no, we're not donating her organ because she's very healthy. Um, we're like, no, we're not donating organs. Um, so after she passes, um, the, the head surgeon comes back around and asks Amber's mother, oh, would you like to donate her organs? Like, so nonchalant. Like, how do you just, we just lost one of the biggest things that meant, that really meant something to our lives. And you're being so insensitive to it. Um, but it all started from incompetence. It all, it all started from negligence. Montefiore and a lot of these hospitals in New York period um, have this same cycle. They have the same exact cycle. They fail to execute and deliver valuable information that can save a life later on down the road. It, it kind of seems like they're just skimming over um, important, important paperwork. Um, because speaking to doctors and speaking to OBs, they're all telling me, hey, even though, even though, you know, Elias was born on 420, he was, he wasn't due until May 30th. Um, doctors were telling me they could have taken the baby out six weeks prior to that. And Amber would be here. Elias would be here. He would have been in NICU longer, but he would be here. They both would be here. Um, so we felt like, that made me feel like they didn't give us options. They pushed the sense of urgency and fear um, into the arms of irrational decisions. And that's, that's exactly what they do to these women. The Bronx has the highest cesarean rate in all of the boroughs, you know, and that's exactly what they're doing to the, all of these women. They're just, they're, they're not giving them options. They, they're, they're making them feel like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, so you have to do this. We're going we're gonna to give you a C-section. You have to do this. Um, and that's what they're doing to a lot, a lot of these women. Um, and I, and I feel like that's where we see a lot of the downfall, um, right there. Oh, sorry guys. It's just tough. Reliving, reliving all of this. It's just, it's just, it's just very hard. Um, you know, Amber knew her OB for a very long time, um, but it kind of felt like her OB's demeanor changed once she found, because I, I was unsettling, I was unsettled with her, her, her OB, the first appointment, um, because she was asking like, oh, she was concerned about our marital status. Um, Amber and I were not married. We had plans, but we, were, we weren't married yet. Um, and it seemed like that OB frowned upon that. Um, and then she asked me, oh, do you have, you know, is this your first child too? No, I have other children back down south. Um, you know, I was in, I was in a, a seven-year engagement. I had, you know, children down south. Um, and she frowned upon that as well. Um, and it seemed like after that, we, we started getting different treatment. Um, than, than, than others. Um, I mean, but that's, that's the whole staff though. Um, that was down from the OB to the, um, to the secretary was being nasty with her to the point where I had to intervene. Um, who else? It was, uh, down to security, you know, the day I took Amber in when she was admitted into the hospital, I'm telling them like, I'm telling them like, we have to make some sort of exception for her. She is scared to death. She does not want to go up by herself. Security at the front telling me, oh, it's okay, Mr. Baby Daddy. Go sit down over there. Um, you can't go up. 
So that's, that's, the, that's the, the kind of treatment that we were receiving from two different Montefiore facilities. And it's disgusting. This is not how you treat people. This is not how you talk to people. Um, so my blood just boils like every time I hear anything Montefiore, anytime I hear um, about, you know, women being cut open, like it just makes my blood boil because I feel like they're, they're, they're not listening to us. They're not worried about us. We are, we are so delusionalized to working for a system that's not going to work for us and that hasn't been working for us. Amber passed away 421, um, a, little, a little past midnight. Um, they called her time of death uh, 1236. Um, I couldn't even, it was hard for me to, to grieve. Like I, I couldn't feel nothing but anger at this point. Um, sh strictly just pu like purely running off of adrenaline. Um, so everybody's, you know, asking me, how are we going to do this? You know, funeral, we all have to chip in. Um, and we've been to a lot of funerals and had to chip in. And, and I just, I got fed up at that point. I was like, no, I'm going to handle everything. You know, Amber's mother shouldn't have to worry about anything. This is the last thing that we should, you know, we came for a birth and now we have to plan a uh, funeral, <laughs> you know, this is not something that we, that we planned. So I, I told everyone, you know, let me handle this. I'm going to take care of everything um, because they just took so much away from me and my son and, and our families. Um, so that's when I started to go fund me. Um, I was only expecting a couple of hundred, you know, um, I was willing to put up the rest. Um, our target goal is between five to eight grand. Um, we made the full eight grand in like four hours, four or five hours. Um, so it, it kind of took off from there. And so, you know, from that point I was like, Hey, this is, this is about Amber, but this is also about the women in New York, you know, um, the way that, the way that black men are being killed in the streets by police are this, it's the same thing happening to these, to these women in the hospitals. Um, so I, I figured, Hey, I can't wait around on this. Amber would not want me to wait around on this. Amber would be in my ear right now. Like, Hey, we cannot let this slide. We cannot let this continue. Um, so I acted and I partnered with um, some strong members in the birthing community. Um, they've, they've helped me establish and, and learn how to operate foundations and um, grants and, and everything. So I've, I took advantage of, of all of my resources and um, I've implemented them into the work that I'm doing now. Um, so I started the foundation so that fathers aren't going through what I'm going through um, because this does a lot to one's mental space. This does a lot to your mental space. Um, this ruins how you function on a daily um, because this changes, this, this alters your whole life. So now you have to redirect, re-strategize, replan, um, and that's hard to deal with while you're, you're fighting your own mental health. Um, so I, I'm engaging in, in, in working with fathers who have dealt with that. Um, I'm working with mothers who have lost their, their child or um, that are just scared to go into the hospital or got uh, cesareans done for no reason when there were other options. Um, or I'm speaking to grandmothers or sisters who have lost their, their daughter or sister um, to maternal, maternal mortality. First of all, I mean, we're all so heartbroken with you and for you and angry with you and for you. And I, I mean, I'm thinking about how to help the audience of people that are listening digest us. Um, but you didn't have a choice. You just had to. <laughs> all at once and um, 
I mean, there, there's a lot to take in here. Um, and I want to make sure that we're, we're talking about what has to change. But I also want to make sure that everybody who's listening has a good understanding of what it is that needs to change. And um, maybe Chanel, I'll, I'll turn to you next to help us like unpack this a little bit. Yeah. Um, first, I want to just start off and just say, Bruce, um, like I give thanks for you sharing your story as a parent, as a mom of six children and somebody who does this work, like no one ever wants to have to recount, you know, a situation where you go in and you are joyous and hopeful about life and bringing life into the world and then you have all these different things happen to you and it catapults you in a position that you weren't even prepared to be in and so one i want to honor you first just for even the willingness of you opening up yourself to being able to share your story because you don't have to do that um but you are and i want to acknowledge that and i want to acknowledge you as a black man and as a father for standing up for truth and rights and what that means um, in these spaces because the perpetuation of the things that continue to happen over and over again, um, my prayer and my hope is that you and your family find peace and you find comfort in, in that your son has the guidance and the wellness that he needs so that he can sustain himself and you all can sustain one another. Um, so I just wanted to start off with that first. Um, you know, it's sad that we have to even have this conversation and it's sad that someone has to experience something like this in order for someone to see the humanity in the individual when they present themselves, right? And, you know, everything that Bruce described in his story is things that advocates like myself and others have been saying for years, right? That we have a systemic issue, right? It's not just about, you know, and, I, and I've said it in, in, in packed rooms full of OBs, you know what I mean? Like patients, ultimately, they want to be seen, they want to be heard, and they want to know that someone genuinely cares about their well-being. Like, point blank. Like, black, white, don't matter what color you are, at the end of the day, people want to be treated like human beings. And what we have lost within the act of caring um, or, or being service to others, because right, an OB, a nurse, a midwife, a doula, that means that you're in the act of service to someone else. That means that you are giving up your time because you essentially want to assist someone in you know, their own well-being, right? They're presenting themselves. And, and, and it's about looking at care from a perspective that is not just looking at the bits and pieces, but understanding like this is a whole human being. This is a whole individual who um, has, you know, these experiences that are happening to them and the intersections of what that means, right? As of being a student and, you know, being a father of, of being, you know, having to go to work, having to think about transportation, having to think about all the other things on top of the fact that, you know, now you're presenting yourself in this institution that is based on structural oppression um, and the historical understanding of too of like how black and brown people have experienced trauma within the, the, the healthcare system and why and, and why there's already a sense of distrust. Within black and brown communities, it's not something that we have to overtly just say and have conversations about because we know, right? We'll make jokes about it. We'll say, you know, we'll, we'll say, oh, I'll give my child everything, Robitussin, everything else before I'm going to the hospital, right? That's the last straw. That means I have to be sick, sick. And that is not because people are trying to defer from going there. It's because of the fact of the, the experiences that they have when they're in there, right? The act of not being listened to. Like Amber, prior to COVID, was saying how she felt disenfranchised, how her voice wasn't being heard, how she was... Um, you know, being dismissed and having condescending conversations towards her and not listening to when she presented something um, and saying, this is what's going on with my body and understanding what it means for an individual to be an expert in their care. You know what I mean? From the time that they have come out of someone, the, all of their ex, uh, social um, lives, their emotional, their physical well-being, that plays a role in how one someone births their children, how they see themselves, how they see their bodies, right? And not taking that into consideration 
is one of the huge, the biggest problems. Prior to COVID happening, I've I've experienced I've seen people be criminalized at bedside, working in the Bronx, working in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? People, um, somebody working with like a, a Seven Day Adventist parent, and they don't want to have a vitamin K shot, and so now you're calling Child Protective Services on them, calling Child Protective Services and weaponizing it and using it as a tool to get someone to comply with a C-section, um, having parents because. The, the father, you know, speaks out and says, listen, I don't like the way my, my, my partner is being treated. And then having um, security guards called on them and escorted them out of the hospital. Like, having seen people illegally drug, babies, infants, have their genitals bagged and their urine taken without their parents' consent for to test to see if they have drugs in their system without their parents even knowing. Having children being placed on hold and parents getting ready to leave from the hospital and then being told like, oh no, you can't leave yet. And they're like, what do you mean? Or you can leave, but your child can't leave. What does that mean, right? And so, and, and to see these things being perpetuated over and over and over again, right? And it's not just, um, I mean, I've worked with private clients where I had a, you know, a, a black female judge who was a home birth transfer, who went to the hospital, who I had to fight, one, for her mother just to be able to say to her, um, I love you and I'll see you when, when you come out before going into surgery. They just wanted to wheel her off. And I was like, you can't do that. You can't just wheel someone off into a space and not give their parent the, the, um, a minute to acknowledge it and to show them to, to look into their eyes and say, I see you and I love you. Like, where's the humanity in that? You cannot do that. And have like charge nurses and people try to kick me out of the hospital because of that. Because I'm trying to center the humanity in someone else. Right, because I'm standing up for something that should be basic human knowledge. Like, regardless of what is happening, there's always a split second for someone to say, I love you, or to touch someone real quick. You know what I mean? Because people need that. They need to have that sense of um, reassurance. Even if they, if that's the last words that they're going to speak, they need to be able to say that in a way that feels good to them. And they're not given that space. I've had to fight for Black women to keep their uteruses right? And in spaces where they're like, oh, well, just take it all out. Wait a minute, you haven't even checked this woman yet. And you're already saying you're going to take their uterus out? Like, how about you do a, 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 an exam first, see what's going on, and then make a decision based on that. And so like, you know, to see these things continuously perpetuate themselves over and over again, like using language like this is what we're going to do, or we're going to do this now, or I'm going to allow you to do this. You know what I mean? That's that's giving directives to someone, telling them that they have no autonomy over themselves, over their bodies, and over decision making that is happening to them as they choose to parent their children. And I've noticed the ways in which, you know, it's not just um, based on racism. It's a systemic problem that has to do with the fact that there's no levels of accountability. There's no levels of transparency, and there's no levels of universal healthcare standards when it comes to maternal health. You have you can be at, there's two, do two hospitals on the same block. One hospital is saying we do this. The next hospital says we have policies and protocols for that. Then you have the individual physicians who have their own standards of practice and how they want to operate. Then you have the nurse who's just trying to follow the orders of the physician that is working within the context of a system who then themselves probably are traumatized by events. Because we're not even thinking about the residual trauma of the provider, right? We talk about how it affects the patient and, and the patient and their birthing experience. But we're not talking about what happens to the provider who experiences trauma and sees traumatic events happen and they have no sense of, of or, or um, a place to be able to, to decompose and to talk about that. And so then that trauma becomes normalized behavior and they continue to perpetuate that on patients every single day. And so it's not just a problem of Yes, it is racism and it is implicit bias, but we need to start to think about what does it mean to have anti-racist medical models of care, right? We'll really teach people and understand the historical implications of how black and brown people have been treated in healthcare and how it continues to perpetuate itself in present times. We also need to talk about how insurance segregation is something that is very real and it is causing people to be treated in different ways um, and not get the same standard level of care and is putting physicians also under this pressure to perform and see a high volume of patients that's not even realistic for any human being, right? We need to talk about how um, systemically across the board within the, within the context of the United States, 
we have a problem when it comes to gender and how we don't see women and black birthing bodies as something that is valuable, how it's always undermined. Um, and that's across the board, right? Because even white women and them experiencing obstructive violence and things happening to them. So it means that we're, we're feeling the magnitude of it. They're getting the residual effects of what's happening, right? Because, and then you have COVID who, who happens where now, you know, at its inception, I remember people calling us and saying, I'm terribly afraid. You know, like, can I get a midwife? Should I cross state lines to go have my baby somewhere else? You know, I'm just going to um, have the, should I just have the baby in the house by ourselves and we'll just, you know, get an order of birth kit online. Like people, people going to drastic measures to figure out a way to make something happen when a lot of the things that are happening could have been avoided had we listened to activists prior to. When activists like myself and others were saying, guess what, guys? We need more birthing centers for low-risk patients. Oh, guess what? You know, we need to have care where people are able to walk around, eat, and drink. We have all this evidence-based information. People want to have all the data in the world, but when a Black woman or a person of color is presenting that data, it doesn't matter unless it's co-signed by somebody who is white. I can sit here as a doula and, and, and talk to somebody till they blue in the face about how, you know, we really need to center a human rights framework. We need to see the humanity in one another. Why do I even have to have these conversations? Like to me, as a living organism, that should be something that comes naturally. Like I shouldn't have to be, I shouldn't, Bruce shouldn't have to be on here having to tell a story about his partner who passed for what? Due to the fact that people just didn't want to take, the, take, the, take a moment. And, it's, and, it, and it goes beyond just someone just saying like, oh, I acknowledge you, I knew your name. It's not about that. That's not what people are saying. Because I know people take it to that level. Like, oh, well, people just want to be acknowledged within the setting. No, it's not that. People want to have autonomy and agency over themselves. They want people to understand that, yes, you are doing your job, but you are more than just your job. And I am a human being. And this is not something where you can like turn over people over and over again on a consistent basis and expect the same results because different, ba different bodies have different uh, outcomes. Like everybody's body is different. And so like, you know, with COVID happening, I said from the door, I had an interview, you know, earlier on with, I think, you know, it was either Forbes or something. And someone asked me a question, what do you think is going to happen? And I said, I know exactly what's going to happen. I said, it, the situation that's going to happen right now is that you're going to see the maternal mortality rate rise because Black women and Black birthing bodies are going to be disproportionately affected by this. Because if you already weren't being listened to from the, from the gate, now you have the, the, the uh, uh, pandemic that is happening where everybody's in crisis mode and everyone's trying to figure something out and, and no one knows what to do. Right, because you're everybody's going like you know you get this information. Information keeps changing. People are trying to like use this, the best practices that they know to try to do something because you know there's a, a magnitude of individuals who are presenting themselves at any one at one time. Of course, these people are going to go by the wayside, and I could just imagine post pandemic what it's going to look like in terms of other disciplines in term in healthcare and how people have not been able to center themselves in their, in their care and their well-being. And this is why we need to really talk about an infrastructure within healthcare that talks about what does it mean for me to care for you in a way that you learn how to care for yourself, right? Where Bruce shouldn't have to go out and, and buy a blood pressure cuff himself. Why is the healthcare system not providing that for them? right or showing them how to do that ahead of time and so instead of judging people and saying oh my god you know these people they just don't show up for their appointments and they're not interested in their health care and you know using all of the excuses you know or they're just not good parents based on their perceived notion of who the individual is and saying how about this how about we teach people how to care for themselves how about we say let me show you how to take your blood pressure let me let me show you how to check your own urine you know what i mean so that you can be actively involved and engaged within your health care so in the event that something happens well guess what you already know what it looks like to have proper care because we've already been talking about this ahead of time but instead the healthcare system is set up in a way to create a codependency it's not set up to create self-sustainability it's not created in such a way for patients to be able to heal themselves. It, it's like, you know, little, this little placement stuff where it's like, I'm gonna put a Band-Aid over it, we'll fix it momentarily, but we're not gonna actually fix it. 
You know what I mean? And we're not going to show you or tell you what it takes to be able to do that in a way that centers the, the person who is experiencing that in real ways. And so what does it mean then for people to meet folks where they are, not where they expect them to be within healthcare? You know what I mean? What does it mean to like listen to them, to hear their voices, to understand that this is a person with a complex identity and provide care from an intersectional perspective that really is like humble, right? That says, you know what? I'm gonna just take it like this. I don't, I don't know. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna say, I don't know, but we're gonna work together so that we can figure it out. Because a patient will respect that more than opposed to a, a, a person standing there before them and acting like they know what they're doing. And then they have no idea what they're doing and they're putting someone more at, at risk than they are, you know, centering them. You know what I mean? And making them feel like they have a sense of, um, I'm here for you and I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what it means for me to care for you. And we don't ask those questions. We don't ask patients, you know, patients, they're not asked like, well, what does care look like for you? Imagine if we just started a sentence out with that, you know? Imagine if like, and, and then like worked from there and created care plans that establish care from, from that starting point, you know what I mean? So that you can understand, well, yeah, you know, like I have other children. So care for me looks like, am I able to bring my other children with me to, to my, my prenatal appointment? Like, will there be childcare readily available? Or, you know, is there an evening hours or something? You know what I mean? So that people feel like it's more than a transactional relationship that someone is really invested in what it means to center someone. You know, and when it comes to like, you know, and also, you know, thinking about just education across the board. You know, we need an educational system that is totally revamped for physicians, for nurses, for midwives, that understands what it means to like work with people, to be with someone, you know what I mean? To, to, to sit with someone. Cause at the end of the day, we're all patients at some, some point. Like everybody wants to be, has to be cared for. And we're not looking at it like that. So, yeah. Chanel, can I be honest with you? So I'm, I'm seeing like a tall order of stuff that we have to fix. And there's like a pattern across Bruce's entire story from the jump about ways that they were dismissed, ways things were missed, the, the ways that there were dog whistles at registration when they came in for care and they, the way they talked to Bruce, the way that there are big differences in the way people communicated with him along pretty clear racial lines. Let's say that there's a second, there's an audience of other families, other people who were scared out there, but there's also, hopefully, if we do this right, other physicians, other cl clinicians like me, like Lash, who are trying to figure out how to do better and be better. And, um, you know, I'm just like turning to you, Lash, like what, what is it like to hear this as somebody who's training through this system and seeing it um, through the eyes of your professors like me and also through your eyes as a person with your own lived experiences that's questioning whether the ways that you're being taught make sense. Yeah, um, it's, it's a lot. Um, and, and first, I just want to say, Bruce, um, thank you for sharing your story. And like, I'm just, I'm just speechless with just like how you demonstrated so much bravery and compassion and like the way you fought for Amber. And um, that, that is just so, that, that really hit me. And I just wanna thank you for, for sharing this space with us. Um, and Chanel, I'm like, you need to teach us a class at HMS because you just came in there spitting facts. And I'm like, this is what we need. And I think the first thing that I'm thinking about is like, why is it that the only reason why I know what a doula does and how they contribute to healthcare is because of things that I've Googled on my own or because of friends that I've spoken with. I think that we're taught in medicine and a lot of us go into medical school thinking like, yes, I want to be a leader. I want to be the person to make decisions for my patient. And it's extremely hierarchical and we don't learn about what a nurse's role is, what a community member's role might be. And I think that it's ridiculous that Bruce is having to bring, um, is, is having to, to make this initiative to bring a birthing center to the Bronx um, when they clearly have like the, the, one of the highest rates of cesarean sessions, I think you were saying. And it's like, we have all of this data and we do all of this disparities work and we're incentivized to continue to come out with more data and more data because that's how we get tenure. That's how we get associate professorships. But why not then incentivize people to actually implement things in the community? We already know what the issue is. So why not put that money that we're putting to creating more data 
into community programs so that we can already start to, to address some of these issues. And I think that those are the things that I'm really thinking about right now because it's so frustrating when you know what we need to do and, and we're not doing that because of political reasons, um, because of ego or wherever it might be. And I think that in medicine, we're taught a lot of hard skills of science, but we, we forget the soft skills as we get more and more indoctrinated into the process of becoming a physician. And I think that if they would have just admitted like that they were wrong and they made a mistake and they should have been looking at her platelet count and that the, the, the system messed up or whatever and just said, sorry, let's fix it. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you and just work from there then we wouldn't have had to be so reactionary and we could have been proactive in making sure that, that we did the right thing from that point. And I think that if we, just, if we can just learn to, to keep those soft skills and that's just being a human and listening to people and understanding when you mess up, I think that we will be in such a, a better place. So I think that the way that, that we're being taught um, in medical education right now, it's, it's a big issue because you, you know, we're incentivized to push papers so that we can get more clout and that doesn't do anything for the community. That only, you know, helps our careers. And then on top of that, we're losing all of these soft skills of being good people and just listening to our patients because we're so focused on trying to develop the differential diagnosis. We're so focused on trying to get to the next patient. Um, and I think that it's, it's really harming those who are already most marginalized in our society. And I think lastly, the thing that's really interesting to me is that we don't have a lot of representation of black bodies in medical education. So when we go out into the world and we see black patients, we have to kind of you know, rewire our brains because we've been seeing white bodies for so long that we're like, oh, this is so, this is so different for me. And I think implicitly, we don't even see black bodies as human. We think the black bodies can, can withstand more pain. There's been studies that have shown that residents think that black people are able to withstand more pain. If we, if we looked at, um, if we look at the opioid crisis, right, and how black people were not prescribed um, opioids at the same rate as white people, in the end, it did lead to us not having to suffer during this crisis as much from opioid um, addiction. But at the same time, the reasoning behind that was a lot, a lot of it was because people were not validating our pain. And there's this, been this traditional erasure of, of black pain, and, and we don't have representation of black people in medical education. And I think that all these things are coming together and unfortunately is leading to these disparate outcomes that we're seeing in this suffering that, um, that Bruce shouldn't have to go through right now and that Amber should have never had to go through. So we have a lot of work to do. I just want to um, kind of veggie back off of Lash and you were just saying so many points, sis, and I'm just, you like throwing them out. And also like, you know, just thinking about the fact that what I've realized too is like, as you're learning these sciences, you're not learning about the ancient science of life, right? And what does it mean to interact with life and the living? You know what I mean? We, we talk about um, things in these like theoretical perspectives. We want to, as you said, you know, put out papers and we want to have our name out there and we want to show that we're making an advancement in sciences. And that is in the modern aspect of like technology and tech and, and, and no type of advancements. But what does it mean for us to have advancements in the ancient science of life and to live? And that is when we start to talk about contextually, what does it mean for one human being to interact with another one? Right, because that in and, of, in and of itself is a science, right? That in and of itself is an art form of what does it mean for me as I advance? And I can even think about myself when I was in my early 20s and having conversations about life. And now as a 40 year old, what does that mean? And being able to articulate, well, what does it mean to be vulnerable? What does it mean to you know, be transparent? What does it mean for me to have accountability within myself? What does it mean for me to be able to pursue work, right? Because the, the hierarchy that you speak of, it is, it is self-serving to ego. Right? It is not self-serving to someone who is trying to come forth in a way that is humble, that says like, oh, I'm doing this and understanding like the community member is the expert within their care. And, you know, it's, it's not just about me being in a community because anybody could be inside of a community. But what does it mean for me to be an extension of that community? What does it mean for me to interact with people on a human level where I see them, they see me and they know who I am? You know what I mean? And I can see, I can see, I can walk down the street and see, you know, clients that I've served and see their children walking and talking. I'm like, oh my goodness, like, I remember when you came into the earth. You know what I mean? 
and being able to like like that is to me that is like being an extension of the community that's like that's that's ain't the ancient sciences of life that's how you start to build trust and when we start to move towards things that are are so technologically advanced that we forget about what it means to have human connection and human connection is not just about centering the stuff that just makes us feel good in terms of wellness because we think about it in that context too of like a massage or going to walk in the woods or you know what i mean and that stuff is great but what does it mean for for folks who don't necessarily have that so like then it means like redefining those things you know what i mean so that it is able to serve everyone you know what i mean so that it's not just talking about you know equality it's not just talking about equity but we're talking about justice you right you're talking about truth and rights and you're talking about you know centering the human experience as living organisms who are interacting with each other every single day you know what i mean and and that i mean all of all of this has to happen not just you know in piecemeal so like neil like as you said like it is a lot it's a laundry list and it's not to shame anyone either right um my my husband always says who feels it knows it right it's not for hey it's not about um saying and pointing the finger right because i also talk about providers and how they're not necessarily supported in the work that they're doing right so like lash coming into you know your profession as a med student and then being able to witness stuff and what if she doesn't have an outlet to be able to express that? And then how is she internalizing that? And then how is that then reflecting in the practice that she will have later on? You know what I mean? Or, you know, and how she engages with, with other individuals. So it's really important for us to start to center all of it, right? And it has to happen together. It can't happen in like, oh, you know, me and this department, we, I'm going to talk about you know, uh, racial racial and implicit bias and explicit bias. No, but over here, we're going to talk about policy and reform. No, it has to, ha all of these things have to be happening congruent, congruently so that we can see systemic change and, and, and institutional change across the board. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what, one thing that I know that we need to do um, is, and, and this comes from, I think the thread across, and it's right when we started pivoting, like Bruce uh, shared his whole story with us and, uh, and, and started to talk about, you know, how really the day after he started springing into action and doing so in a way that is very much along the lines of what Lash is telling us we need to do, um, which is to put our attention back to the community doing the things that we know work. Um, and um, Bruce, I wanna make sure that you've got a moment to tell us about how, how it is you're doing that through your foundation, through the, um, the birth center that you're bringing to your community in the Bronx and the event that you have planned to help stand all that up. So I've been, I've been springing into action. I've been speaking to um, you know, members of Congress. I've been speaking to celebrities. I've been speaking to public figures, activists, um, everyone that I could, that I could, you know, ha share this space with and share the awareness around this because this has to stop. Um, so I've actually partnered with the, the ladies that we were going to take on as our midwives and doulas, um, birth from the earth and, and the birthing place. And I've partnered up with them and we're working on bringing a birthing center to the Bronx. Um, so we can get more attentive care so we can have a hub dedicated to education wellness and and birth um because i feel like in the hospitals as well they lack education um there are times where i've went to these hospitals out here and they're trying to just inject me with whatever and not even telling me what, what it is um they're like oh we have this here for you we're gonna inject you with this and you'll be you'll be good okay but what is that you know um things like that that needs to stop that needs to stop we need to understand what's going inside of our bodies we need to um, we need doctors to listen um for our concerns rather than just brush us off um you know if we feel like we need to be seen 
we need to be seen. Um, what it, what it, it's not going to hurt you. In fact, it's going to make you look better for double checking. And on top of that, your client has that peace of mind that they're okay. So yeah, we're, <clears throat> we, we are working on bringing a birthing center to the Bronx. We have, uh, we've looked at several different locations. Um, we're just trying to look at a few more before we, um, I guess, settle and then start putting our energy and funds towards the project. Um, because as you noticed, this isn't the city putting this together. This is the community putting this together. Um, because now it's getting to the point where we can't trust um, the, the hospitals. We're, we're getting to that point where we don't want to go to the hospitals. Um, we're not getting the intensive care that we deserve. So why not create a wellness hub um, where they are going to get that? Um, where they're going to feel comfortable, where they're going to feel more at home. Um, and yeah, the foundation is, is looking out for, for those mothers who have um, dealt with the incompetence or the negligence or um, have faced uh, morta maternal mortality, um, infant morbidity. Um, and of course, looking, uh, looking over uh, mental health for fathers in my position as well. So these are all things that my, you know, foundation is, are, are gearing towards. Um, but right now, the primary focus is, is bringing a, um, a birthing center to the Bronx. Um, so what I'm actually doing, um, I held a press conference in front of Montefiore um, back, in, back in May. Um, and I'm actually hosting another, uh, I'm, I'm hosting a mother's march. We do have people in Congress flying out. We have um, activists flying out. Um, you know, Ta Tanya Lewis Lee is gonna be there. Um, you know, uh, uh, the whole birthing community, uh, um, a lot of doula associations that I've um, spoken with, um, you know, midwives, uh, pretty much everyone in the birthing, birthing community. I, I have OBs coming out, um, doctors who are coming out. Um, and this, you know, I, I've been able to manage and take advantage of the resources that I've connected with. And, you know, they're all giving me these platforms that I'm on all the time. But I feel like at the end of the day, I'm not a mother, um, but I, I, you know, I've seen what mothers gone, have gone through and I want to give these mothers who have dealt with, um, dealt with these issues. I want to be able to give them a platform to speak so they can share their story so they can finally have people connect with how they're feeling. Um, and fathers as well, because even though it's a mother's march, it's expected for fathers to, to show out um, because we need to be here for our women. So I have activists that are coming to speak. I have mothers that are uh, willing to share testimony, wanting to speak. Um, so it's, it's going to be it's going to be a big event. I think what I want the audience of people to hear um, in this, at least as I'm reflecting it back as an obstetrician listening to this, is that um, what I hear pretty clearly in your story, Bruce, and the way that you tell it and the way that Chanel is seeing the problems and the way that Lash is seeing the problems that the, is that there's um, a well-founded crisis of trust alongside a crisis of racism that's been breached um, and that what I'm hopeful about is that through the work that all three of you are doing and through maybe having more conversations like this, um, we can start to heal some of that and, and bring, bring people together in the way that you are in your community in the Bronx, bringing people together across, including the medical community, um, but also including the community itself and people who've been long advocating for these changes. Um, so I just encourage everybody who's listening to this now to continue to follow the Save a Rose Foundation, follow Ancient Song Doula Services. Um, Ancient Song has a campaign, Listen to Me Now, which you can find through their website, and, um, and follow Lash, who's continuing to teach all of us about how medical education should change too. Um, 
don't let this be the end of the learning journey by any means. Um, and please stay tuned to this series too, where I think this is our first one. I can't imagine a more powerful way to get this going. I'm really grateful to all of you uh, for giving your time, giving your experience, giving your really personal and painful stories. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I just stay tuned uh, because we're gonna continue to do this and continue to have these really important conversations.